Good evening. Good evening. Welcome all. We'll let uh, folks kind of join in here, but awesome to see friendly faces as usual. Thank you for taking the time to come listen, learn, review, execute, and just do that on repeat day in, day out, week in, week out. So um, it's kind of going to be the theme of this evening's call. Gavin, what a great video, my man. Forwards, backwards, mean business. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> what's going on i'm good man i'm good good and you're repping the the sun's baseball team too one more game tomorrow that's awesome. summer league yeah and then it's uh it'll be quiet for a little bit well that's good you guys been having fun though yeah lots of fun it's been good, good. i'm glad to hear it glad to hear it it's important, right? You got to have those uh, those things that, yeah, you know, distract you a little bit. Not distract you, but uh, what's the right word to that bring you joy, right? Outside of because uh, I know we we all love this game and we love kind of diving into the notebook and executing in in the portfolios across whether it's personally or professionally, like you do now, Gavin. Uh, but it's it's important, right? Uh, it's important to have those moments with family and. Or friends, or going for a hike, playing golf, whatever it might be, going for a kayak. Um, but yeah. All right. Uh, so, folks, I'm sure we'll kind of trickle in, but why don't we get started uh, tonight? You know, I really kind of want to make sure we kind of review the process, right? I mean, there's been, in my humble opinion, a lot of noise out there, uh, you know, a lot of noise for a market that's gone relatively sideways between kind of, you know, yeah, for, for the last week. Right. And, and just remember a week does not, you know, does not make a trend. Uh, a week does not um, really change in terms of like what is coming down the horizon and what we're seeing from uh, a general outlook, not only for this upcoming Q2 earnings, which, you know, JP Morgan reports um, next, next week, and and but also just from kind of the the what's on the horizon in terms of uh, the quad environment, uh, not only in, in Q3 here as we head further into Q3, but we got Q4, Q1, and and it's kind of a global it's a it's a global uh, global environment that's everybody's kind of going through a very similar situation, and that's going to you know likely just perpetuate stuff. So I uh, just kind of wanted to reiterate that and sometimes you know there's a lot of noise about the here and now and what's happening today and. Uh, but it's important too to just kind of you know sometimes take a step back right and and or just leave the portfolio and let it do its thing because you got it set up in, in the way that you want it to to you know the exposure that you wish and just kind of let it let it do let it do its thing so um, I think that's going to be a key theme for that I'll try to reiterate tonight um, on top of some of the uh, core stuff that's popping out to me but um, you know uh, boys you got anything kind of to add to that point in terms of just sticking with uh, with your process, whatever that looks like. And I say boys because it's currently only Gavin, Trent, Jimmy, and Brian up here. But no, the girls are also welcome. Or ladies. <laughs> I'll be the first one to break yeah, the silence and just it, say Jimmy. what's up, Robert. Yeah. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I've been also distracted on, by some things. But, um, you know, one week does not a cycle make. And even just looking at what's transpired with things like, let's say, energy and oil, um, you know, I remember us talking about this all year, really, right? The different phases of this quad four and how the different chapters are transpired. Um, And I don't know if it's a head fake, right? But certainly slicing through trade and trend, um, are we finally here, right? This kind of this third chapter where some of the deflationary consensus starts to get built in to to asset prices uh we will see we will see but i think we have a lot of fun things to talk about tonight so i'll be here to be here to listen and to chime in where i can and uh and to no trolling tonight no small (laughs) thoughts tonight uh but you got these companies being left for dead you know play with but but listen jimmy i mean (laughs) you know i'm not but everybody's got a different process, right? A different approach to the game, right? So, you know, if 
if you want to have, you know, again, I'm not, I'm picking on, I'm saying you as in like generally you, right? Not, yeah, not specifically course. Jimmy, but you know, if you want to have a three to five year horizon and you can weather a 20% or 30% drawdown, like, you know, further kind of pain or drawdown in companies that you, you really like and you, and you, you've done, you know, high quality research on, et cetera, et cetera, whether it's from the guys at Hedgeye or your own due diligence, you know, what have you. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that either, Jimmy, right? Like there's like, everybody's got their own style and their own, um, investment horizon. And, and you can also have a sprinkling of all sorts of different kind of components there, knowing that, you know, I'll just pick on Playboy, for example, right? It's down at like, you know, it's around six bucks, I think it was. Um, I don't know where it actually ended up today, but uh, PBLI. 636. Yeah, six, 636. There you go. Yes. So, you know, 636, you know, if you want to hold on to that and you're like, I got a five or 10 year horizon on this bad boy and I want to load up, uh, I don't know, 100 shares or something, right? It's like, okay, cool. I got a, I got six hundred dollars worth of, of Playboy, and it's just going to sit here. And 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 you know, there's nothing wrong with that, right? If you've got companies that you, even if it's a big boy like an Amazon, right? I mean, tech, you know, not, not, I don't want to be like technically, but um, McGough and and um, McLean, they both uh, are positive on on Amazon. It's just the signal doesn't agree. So if you want to just slide that bad boy in your in your um, you know in, in the corner of your portfolio, then. By all means, that, that's up to you. It's a decision that you have to make and you have to live with those consequences. Just like if you, you know, Jimmy, I know you still own Ooster. So even, so if you own Ooster, at, you know, hundred uh, percent. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you, if you want to own Ooster, then that's on, you know, at a dollar 57, then that's also up to you. Right. And, and that's, that's totally cool. I think there's, you know, there's, again, I just want to say there's like a lot of noise out there and there's, and, you know, there is a process and it's, but I think it's important that it's your process. You have to take all the tools at hand and maybe you carve out a small portion of the portfolio to allow you to kind of have exposure to these names that you, you know, want to own five or 10 years from now, but maybe you also take a larger chunk of the portfolio and, you know, put it towards stuff like that's going to, you know, hopefully work more um, proactively in the, in the interim. I and if you just, want to be, you know, sorry, Gavin, I was just, I was going to lead you in, you know, you made a great tweet today. Like if you want to hold more cash, even yeah. though it doesn't look like it, your cash is going up if you're in USD, right? And that's cool. Totally cool too. You don't have to trade every chop, you know, when VIX near 30, um, find your time to play. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I was just going to say the, uh, I mean, it's, I, I know it's easy to get numb to things, right? So we've been talking about like bullish dollar for a while, but that move in the dollar on Tuesday, I think, was the largest move in either direction all year. I mean, that was a really big move. And now it's – I'm just looking at UUP real quick. It's almost mm-hmm. up like 2% this week so far. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's like <laughs> – it's you know, that's that's just what is happening, you know. So, um, this is not, not – uh, something to ignore. And it, I think it's like, we've been talking about long dollar and it's look, there's not always something for me that's like really exciting to talk about. So from a marketing standpoint, it's like, well, I'm just going to keep saying the same thing. Cause all I do is like, wake up, check, run the numbers, see what unfolds, run the numbers, go to bed, wake up, run the numbers, see what unfolds. Run, you know, like, and we could be doing that for like a year. And the, the most exciting thing right now is that this, transition in in rates in in the u.s actually looks like it could be it, this could be it but like josh said on the call today it's like just just chill out because mm-hmm. it, you know it's gonna take time i've thought it's gonna take time like for months now and it, it's going to like with the move at 150 or above um like things can slam back the other way so quick. So even if you think this is like the turn, so many people are like DMing, like, when are you going to buy bonds or like, and it's like, just relax. Like how much, how many treasuries are you really going to buy with the move at one fifty? You know, like, let's just see where it goes. And, uh, but this, I, I would say this, and I've been seeing it in the numbers and it looks like the 10 year is leading the charge, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, and, and that was incrementally, um, strengthening that way today as well. And so whatever's going on with the curve, I guess it's inverted to twos, tens by like five or six basis points right now. Uh, I think that's where we closed. So 
Uh, but that's like the next thing that, that I'm seeing is like, well, what's going to happen with that? You're long China, at least. I, I mean, I'm long China. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's pretty simple. It's not that exciting. But I'm excited to see what some other people, I always, you know, like whatever, you know who has great stuff is Trend. It's like, and Brian, you you were talking about Muni Bonds, obviously. And so maybe that's interesting to talk about. But um, as far as the macro, it's kind of like, you know, that video I posted today, like what, what has done better than the, the cash balance in your account over the last three months? Not many things that you could be long of. Right. So. Yeah. And, and Gavin, I mean, I mean, the time, the time to get long bonds was basically about two weeks ago and say the 20, 28th when it, you know, you know, again, if you wanted to do it for a trade, it was, it was like, you know, 28th, 29th when it started to break down, but then the move index started to move in the opposite direction. So typically, you know, just in terms of if you're, executing in in a you know according to your plan or or kind of the the quote unquote rules you, you know an increasing volatility in an asset is not something that typically attracts you know uh, funds right and, and and attracts capital so it's kind of like would, would have been counterintuitive to be like okay yeah i'm going to go from you know 320 down to 277 now in hindsight would that have been a really great you know uh, great call or great good, good trade absolutely because that was a, that's a it's been a massive move in rates but it also bounced right off of that trend line at 277 you know it took a cup of coffee underneath it but um but it's it's moved right back right back up and and looks like and, and move has remained elevated so again it's one of these things where you know this and that was going to be one of my uh kind of chats tonight was about just volatility in general you know it's it's just you know stay cognizant of like what's moving uh, what's out there right and what's happening in, inside of the volatility complex not just within like the vix and rvx and vixen but what's happening in high yield spreads what's happening in the move what's happening in ovx gvz you know the the list goes on and on in terms of like just volatility in general across asset classes because it all you know the the uh, another good one would be the global fx volatility it's massively elevated too um so it's like you know it's an environment right now where you're getting a lot of um you know there's just a lot of trending volatility in the wrong direction for many asset classes uh, yeah i'd like Jim, to add <clears throat> yeah go ahead Jim. so uh from a standpoint of uh what's coming through and this is important i think we discussed or touched upon it uh, slightly last time of if you have anything in your portfolio which needs financing in the next three to six months try to get rid of it right now wait for it to get shellacked and then get into it back again if you really love that company and if you really need it predominantly because uh, i've shared uh, in the tweet nest the u.s high yield uh, this is ccc and below uh, effective index yield the markets have dried up i spoke with a few dealers um, on the bond desk and they were explaining to me that there's literally no market uh, being made in that space which is CCC and below junk, right? Uh, which also means two more things. Number one, you know, any rally in JNK is worth fading at the moment, unless things change otherwise. And clearly, uh, we have been told that, you know, uh, from all sorts of analysis by the Fed, by everyone else, that, hey, you're not going to get a quick bailout this time at least not until election or not until the time we start seeing unemployment tick up or, you know, a few other sources of inflation uh, being faded. The second part, I wanted to make sure um, that everyone is uh, having their eyes on, especially from a portfolio tail perspective, is I know in asset, traditional asset allocation, international used to be a very key portion, especially international developed. Be extremely cognizant of that because some of the international developed markets have given negative 30% plus uh, returns, meaning, you know, if you look at Poland, year to date has been minus 35. If you look at uh, even much bigger markets, right? Poland is a tiny market. But if you look at much bigger markets like Germany, that is minus 32%, minus 33%. Um, And they are actually about to get worse because just to give you a uh, quick start, Germany, when they were trying to, uh, you know, a lot of companies were trying to get their electricity, including Tesla, you know, Tesla is a 
Berlin Giga Factory, and it needs electricity for that. They are not generating through their solar roofs or something. Uh, that electricity, when all when the all the industrial uh, companies within Germany are trying to acquire it, the one year forward price for that electricity has gone vertical, three hundred and twenty five. Uh, euros per megawatt hour was the price i posted about i posted a tweet earlier i'll share it again in the tweetness but that chart if you look at it one year forward electricity went vertical now what does that do to their overall uh, nation if you look at their pmis they are plummeted they are not plummeted into contraction yet but they are on the border of their teetering you know i wouldn't be surprised if one of the major g7 nations in the next month's pmi or the month after that start showing a contraction the third part which i wanted to touch upon so this is international developed uh, market within emerging market there's a uh, uh, slight divergence so on one hand we have china that is uh, easing uh, they're easing they're going to reopen but then you know shanghai had few more cases so they're kind of tightening that again but them opening reopening uh had less to do with their stocks going up them easing had much more to do with the stocks going up plus some of the specific stocks that we keep discussing right kweb pdd nds uh etc those are much more linked to the government backing off from a standpoint of their uh their portions uh, uh uh you know them getting penalized significantly last but not the least um so with an emerging market that was one trend i wanted to highlight that uh the largest component of eem which is china is going one way but the other components of eem are going the other way for example thailand completely getting shellacked right taiwan not doing well at all and even though taiwan and china are neighbors but taiwan tends to follow where semiconductor goes where the demand goes so on and so forth so having said uh, these two major trends i wanted to uh, in domestic market identify a couple of interesting aspects one of them is biotech it is giving some surprising base formation and relative strength in the overall markets um and also which is kind of surprising because they are long duration assets right and we're trying to figure out um that if they need financing we had mike taylor earlier uh, on our spaces earlier in the year he had clearly mentioned that the aggregate biotech industry needs around especially in the clinical stage needs about 50 billion plus um, financing but that was more in the clinical stage but companies such as biib or gilead they're showing some sort of resilience here which is in line with the quad four play which uh, in quad four we tend to have healthcare t- trying to outperform so uh this goes back to dr t's comment uh that uh, you know nothing was working and now maybe we are going to start having healthcare to start working back again uh last but not the least i want to touch upon currencies um euro completely whacked uh lots of reasons for that uh i have covered my euro shorts i don't know whether we'll go to parity or not <laughs> but i definitely have covered most of my shorts uh on the euro side uh where this dollar rally ends god knows uh typically there tends to be a correlation of uh, dollar easing off once oil tends to ease off but we'll see what happens so those are all my um all my uh, observations rob back to you thanks man well done uh, jimmy you had your hand raised and i'll, I'll uh, pass it off to your point Sure. I, I just had one follow up. You know, you guys have been talking about volatility, and it was interesting to see Keith hit the buy on KWeb. Now, again, we know why he's been bullish on China. The you know the one month, the three month is improving. Um, I'm in KWeb, but um, KWeb's got an implied vol of over seventy percent. And when you look at some of the components inside of it, you know, I'm also long some of these other names. Um, you got to stomach that volatility a little bit, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like up five, down five, up 10, sometimes down 10, down, like it's a, it's a process, but uh, the signal clearly is there compared to some of the other equity options. So I'm going to stick with it, right? I'm going to, I'm going to ride it out. Like I've ridden out some of my small caps and uh, 
we'll see where that goes. But th- th- that's definitely improving. But um, definitely ballsy, right? Because for a while, he was not on any equities on the long side. But uh, he's committed to China verbally. And then now with this RTA. Yeah. And, and you know, it's been, uh, if you guys check your ETF Pro update from this week, you know, you'll notice another uh, component was added there as well. So, you know, out of four longs to them are, are, are Chinese exposures, which is, uh, which should kind of tell you a lot about what, um, what that quad outlook is, is like for, for China versus the rest of the globe. And, you know, Jimmy, you know, that, that volatility, it, it's such a good point. And, and I think, you know, with that in mind, you've got to figure out what sizing is right. Right. And I shared a, a tweet from, from uh, an account that I really enjoy following. It's called trading, uh, trading composure, excuse me. And it's about positioning sizing. Right. And and so if it's too big, you're, you're going to care too much. If it's too little, you're not going to care enough is basically the, the gist, but um, you know, that's, it, it's important. And it's not only important for the one's portfolio, but you know, having it, it kind of all is a domino effect, right? Because, if you've got the right sizing on, you can take some profits when it's time, right? So when it's up 5%, 6%, 8%, if you're at, if you're at or near your max, let's just say hypothetically it's 4%, you know, for K-Web, um, you know, so if you're at 4% or three and a half, three and three and three quarters, you know, you can take 25, 50, you know, a hundred bips off the table, you know, book those profits. And then, you know, when the time comes, you, you can just be more patient because you're still riding, a min size position, you know, right. You're, you're at two, two and a half percent, something like that. And, um, and, and so you're still riding that min position. So you're still gaining that longer term outlook, uh, for, for that exposure, for that, uh, position size. And when the time comes, you can kind of pounce now it might not be at the same level that you took profits. Maybe it's at a better level, who knows, but, um, you know, it's, it's a really important component, uh, Jimmy, that I think does. Come That's such a good point, it, so. Robert, it's such a yeah. good point. Even if you're hodling some stocks like me, like you still yeah. got to trade them and try to yeah. earn like your basis back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So it's, so it's, it all kind of does flow into one, one, you know, flow one to the other, right? It's like, uh, it's a living, breathing stream, the portfolio allocation and portfolio management. Uh, Dear point. Welcome. It's such a pleasure to have you on and thank you for joining. Oh, oh thank you, Robert. Uh, it, uh, the thing was, I actually had this conversation with Nancy yesterday. Oh, nice. So, um, no, I, I think that if you look at the rates market, there's uh, I, I forgot who touched on um, the move uh, and, and rates of all. But until that starts to settle, I, I don't really think um, you're going to see kind of any sort of like jump risk and in, in equity volatility. So equity volatility is going to, I, I think, uh, remain relatively tame. Um, the uh, and Mike Green actually, Prof Plum wrote a, a great piece back. I, I think January of 2020, um, kind of on on um, like why implied vol's been elevated from a historical point, but why it's been kind of flat. And you're not seeing like like jump or gap risk, um, which is a great paper. Um, the next thing I, I think is kind of the the yield curve inversion, and um, I was looking at the twos, fives, tens butterfly today. Um, and so, like you're seeing in the bond market, I guess, uh, this pricing and probability of, of the Fed kind of reversing course. But um, I, I, for some reason, this has kind of been like news to a lot of people. But I mean, if, if you've looked at like euro dollar futures curves since uh, I think like December of last year, they were inverted. So, I mean, this this is like really nothing to be like surprised about. Um, and um, as for the uh, I, I know trend was talking about the dollar. Um, I, I think the dollar is going much higher. Um Usually the way that I measure that, it's like by looking at the, the cross currency basis swap against, you know, um, the U.S. dollar versus other currencies um, uh, across different tenors and across like different currencies, whether you're looking at the pound, the yen or the euro. Um, all of those are more negative than they were during the beginning of the pandemic. So I, I think the dollar strengthens from here. Um, and yeah, that's kind of everything that I had to add on on, on those Awesome. Thanks to your point. Really appreciate it. And some, and some uh, excellent points and, you know, that uh, FX space. Yeah. That's, um, it almost feels like it's the, it's just the beginning, even though we are up you know, nine, 9% on the dollar or what have you, or let, you know, over 11, you know, 10, 11% on UUP uh, year to date. So it's uh, definitely an interesting environment to be in for sure. Uh, Brian, uh, how you doing, man? Robert. Thanks again, for sharing the, uh, 
your your weekly update on the on the muni bond space i did put that up in the nest so for everybody's um so for everybody who is looking for it uh the muni guys shared his uh his weekly kind of um uh, muni bond spreads up there so it's up in the nest so take a look at your at your leisure yeah so um i go on vacation and i get back and it's like what happened uh muni bonds uh just they just rallied like crazy um so I kind of adjusted the the weekly post that I do and, and did it um, with the yield curve, the MMD AAA rated um, geo yield curve was on each Wednesday. So each day that we had this call, so you can kind of align it to, you know, what you're seeing in, in the equity markets and other markets and, and kind of, you know, see how, uh, see how it, um, how it's flowing. But, you know, in, a, in one week's time from today to last week, we've had uh, a 23 basis point rally in municipal bond rates, tax exempt. I mean, that's that is huge. That's a huge move in uh, in, in rates uh, yields downward um, And a couple of things. I made some points just to um, kind of go over. And, and I, I kind of like the intro tonight of of, you know, everything is just kind of a yawn. Right. Um, my first point is timing. You know, we are exactly to the day, six weeks, um, between fed meetings. So we're at the midpoint. Um, and I, I had some questions before about, you know, when I'm putting my issuer hat on and we're selling bonds for, for a city or a county or a utility, you know, we want to sell bonds when things are calm, right? When, when the bond VIX is, 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 you know, not in the F bucket. And that's what we're seeing right now. So um, right now it's for us, you know, it's a good time in between Fed meetings where the waters are calm uh, and people are buying to uh, to get deals done. Now on a, on the personal account, you know, to lower yields means you're not going to earn as much. And that's just, um, you know, the, the way that timing works in the bond world. My second point on timing goes back to my uh, my Mike Taylor path to the bottom. And that is, where are we at, you know, and, and we're at number four. So if you go back to that, um, that map, you'll see that, you know, the next step number four is what he called earnings recession uh, in July and August. So to me, looking at the calendar, I think it's uh, next Thursday, the 14th, JP Morgan kind of kicks off with the banks and uh, we'll see what, uh, what Jamie Dimon's got up his sleeve, um, you know, at the tail end of next week. And, you know, maybe we we see some uh, see some action in the um, in the equity markets, but um, you know I'm really trying to stick to and keep my emotions in check using that uh, path to the bottom, and we're literally only at number four, just getting to it. Um, after that, if my uh, memory is correct, we get uh, redemptions. So um, still a long way to go in the in the Mike Taylor viewpoint. Um, n- number, uh, number two here for me is, is rates and that's tax exempt rates. Um, you know, f- one, two, three weeks ago, you know, the average rate year one through 25 was a 288 today. It's a 253. I mean, you're talking a, a, a pretty hefty move bonds that I was buying at four and a half, four and a quarter. I'm lucky to get at 4% today. So, um, we're seeing a huge rally in, in, in rates where I was talking about uh, before just we were having difficulty getting just bond issues completed. Um, today, I thought was interesting was that muni bond rates tax exempt rallied, even though treasuries sold off. So the, 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 the concept that there's the spread to the tax exempt rate got too wide, um, you know, that's another um, – piece of this muni bond puzzle to try and, and, and figure out all the data points. So you saw muni bond rates rally today, even though um, the, you know, tread to 10 year treasury sold off. Um, my next point, and this is just kind of a, a, a generic point is, is the rotation of money. Um, you know, I thought long and hard of this while I was on vacation and, you know, during COVID, I purchased equities for income I normally would not purchase. I purchased high yield um, funds that I normally would never purchase. And I also purchased leveraged funds that I would normally never purchase. 
because interest rates were zero and, you know, I wanted to earn income. And so you, you have people that typically would have money in higher credit quality bonds and, and other type of fixed income instruments that moved away from those during the, the, the zero percent time. And now all of a sudden, you know, there's, there's a yield. And I think I made a comment that you know, instead of buying UUP, I actually took a chunk of, of cash and bought three year CDs at 2% and said, Oh, they mature o- October 3rd. What am I going to do with that money in the next 90 days? Pretty much nothing. So, you know, 2% on a CD, um, you know, that's, uh, that's real money for some people. And so, you know, is it, is it, is it, uh, some people are rotating out? Uh, you know, I think that's a piece of it. The other piece of it is, is, you know, I, I was thinking about what Trend just said in the triple C market, the junk bond market. I mean, is there anybody out there on this call that would purchase for themselves or even purchase for their enemy carnival cruise bonds right now? Like there's no way everybody knows where that ship is headed. So, so you're, you know, when you, when you look at it, just from, just kind of excellent pun, by the way. uh, Yeah. I mean, a little, just, just from a, a generic basic standpoint, like what I'm doing with my mother's money, right. I'm buying like bonds, CDs and bonds that I couldn't buy, you know, 12 months ago. Um, I've already touched on in between, um, fed meetings, uh, from an educational perspective, I just want to reiterate the MSRB municipal security rulemaking board's website. They've got a tab called the education center and they have a bunch of information on buying and selling bonds. Um, I, I would, would encourage people to go there and just read the PDF documents that they have. Um, very educational on the processes. Um, and then my last two points is, um, uh, I've said this before, I, um, I'm not a real big in buying, selling and, and, and trading. So, you know, what's my process? My process is I'm building out a muni bond portfolio, both for income and for the drip. So I can, you know, drip the, div- the dividend or the, the income pieces into other asset classes. Um, and then I'm in cash, just like Gavin's post today. I'm in cash waiting for hedge eye say it's time to go long stocks. And, uh, you know, again, there's no crime in, in just being patient and waiting. Um, and then the last thing is, is um, I posted a bond issue today. I haven't put up the link for it, but in my post after the rates to uh, the rate post I did today, um, <clears throat> I had a call with, um, with Mitchell um, today and, um, you know, Mitchell's with Other Side Asset Management. We had a long discussion about municipal bonds, about, you know, p- clients that he represents and um, the best way to get access to municipal bonds and, and to buy them at the initial reoffering price. And um, so he and I agreed that we would do a test case, that we would, um, we would put this bond issue um, up for everyone to see. It's public information. Um, it's going to sell next uh, Wednesday. We'll price it. I'm hoping that the market stays firm. And um, he's going to reach out to his uh, intermediary, and I'll let him speak on it on his behalf on his process. But um, the way that this bond issue is set up is that retail um, orders get filled first. So this notion that you know I have to buy a fund because these, these funds get access to bonds that I don't get access to as a retail investor is simply not true. Um, the, the rules have been adjusted. And when you look at what's called the priority of orders for my bond sale next week, it will say uh, South Carolina retail gets filled first, national retail gets filled second, uh, then SMA accounts, and then it goes to all other. So if you put an order in for 100 bonds in the, the 2025 maturity, um, when we close out the book at the end of the day, you're getting filled before Vanguard gets filled, before BlackRock gets filled. And so um, uh, Mitchell and I talked about it uh, a lot on two levels. Uh, one was on the level of um, you know him and representing his clients and, and learning and and he's been in the business before too, but just getting a, a little bit of a refresher on kind of the, the rules 
um, of today and, and the protections for retail investors and make sure they get access, but then also to do kind of a test case for everyone to see not only sort of my side of it, but to see his side of it as somebody that's you know going to go out and actually try to purchase um, a bond uh, you know, from this physical bond issue. So I have the, uh, the prospectus or the official statement, but it is not up on Piper Sandler's website yet. So I don't want to put a link out until it's on, uh, their website since they're the underwriter for the, uh, for the transactions. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions and I'm also happy to turn it over to, uh, Mitchell to kind of give his thoughts on um, our conversation today. Uh, you want to take George's question before I chat, Robert? Or yeah, let's do that. Yes, uh, George. Go yeah, ahead and can you hear me? Yeah, uh, thanks. So, your so all I was going to say is that I'm very interested in hearing how this works. I know Mitchell used the same platform as me, TD. So, go. <laughs> so, this is a South Carolina issue uh, from what Brian's discussed with me. This one particular issue, as Brian talked about, is... Uh, South Carolina retail first, uh, then national retail. So I'm going to work through, I don't have a South Carolina client to buy these specific bonds, but I'm going to work through the desk to have them make a few calls to see if I did have an issue, what would be my chances or what would they say in terms of getting them and what the process would be. So we're, I'm, I'm, actively searching right now for some Illinois bonds for uh, a few clients. Um, so uh, again, uh, Brian gave a little bit of an edu- a lot of an education in terms of how some things are since I last sold Muni's, which was oh, probably over a decade and change ago, things have changed to, to benefit the retail client as opposed to most orders or new issues getting taken down by institutional uh, clients now retail as, as Brian's mentioned, uh, protected. So, um, once I have, uh, once I've gone through the, the work to figure out, uh, how it works, George, I will definitely without question DM you and let you know. Um, there, thank there, you. I appreciate that. There is, there is some work behind it where you kind of have to keep your eye out on this, uh, MSRB, uh, Emma system where y- you can, you can track some of the new issues coming, especially, uh, and Brian, correct me if I'm, if I'm mistaken or, or misstating this, but especially from the standpoint of negotiated deals, as opposed to the competitive bids, the negotiated deals, um, are often more so the, the retail first easier to get than some of the competitive bids. Uh, am I wrong in making that statement or no? You're correct. So in a negotiated deal, um, the, the process from a 10,000 stand, 10,000 foot standpoint is the issuer and the underwriter enter into an, an agreement that they will go out and find, uh, buyers for the bonds. And it's a process of iterations where you go out with the scale, you take orders, um, and hopefully you're oversubscribed. So if there's a million dollar block, hopefully you have two, three million dollars in orders and then if the interest rate was two, you cut it to, you know, cut it by three basis points to 197. And, you know, theoretically, two million, two million dollars in orders drop off. And then you have, you have parity a million um, both sell on the sell and on the buy side. Um, in that process, you create what's called the priority of orders. And that then allows retail to have a, you know, more fair footing. Um, uh, in terms of getting access to bonds, um, the local governments use the negotiated process less than, say, state governments do. And that can be good and bad depending on your state. So, in, in since Mitchell, Mitchell mentioned Illinois, you know, Illinois is not a stellar credit from a state perspective. So, we've got a little more homework to do on the Illinois yep. side. But the, the the negotiated process is is easier for a retail investor to get bonds at the initial offering price. A competitive sale is where we simply put up the bond issue with a date and time. There's an electronic platform and we just take bids from institutions, um, you know, 11 o'clock on say Wednesday and at 11, you know, one second after we can see who won the bid and, and, and you have to 
have a relationship or have a firm that has a relationship with the firm that won or be in the syndicate of the winning, um, the win, the winning bidder in order to get access to bonds. But that priority of orders doesn't necessarily exist in a competitive sale. The negotiated process is really more friendly for a retail investor. And it's important, I, I think, for everybody listening, especially high net worth guys and 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 advisors too. Um, Brian's been not pushing, but educating. high net worth people, Mitchell. High net worth people. Uh, fair, hundred percent, without question. Uh, individuals, high net worth individuals. Um, it's um, it's one of those things where a 7% plus taxable equivalent in today's world with that safety profile is something that many should consider with a, a sleeve of their portfolio. It, it's individual bonds are, are completely different animal than, than bond funds. The bond fund you are buying and selling, trading, making a, a gain or a loss based upon the directionality of interest rates in many cases may be on, on something you know, may, maybe on some bond funds, you're, you're collecting some type of a coupon. It's, it's not a, it's not necessarily a great coupon. Um, but at the same time, there's no maturity as to where you're going to get your principal back on, on those. Uh, the, so you, you do have to worry about the fluctuations in interest rates much more than you do an individual bond. If you're in a current bond fund, and and rates have gone up and the prices of those that bond fund has gone down well there's no maturity on that saying well hey in five years you're going to get your principal back which in today with with a a straight up tax-free bond at a seven percent seven and a half percent taxable equivalent depending upon the state that you're in you know if you're in kentucky or illinois you're at four and a half ish or, or 495 if you're in New Jersey, you're over seven. If you're in New York, you're over seven and change just on state tax. And then if you're in the highest bracket, you could be paying 30, you know, 45, getting pushing on 50 percent in terms of taxes. So some of these taxable equivalents can get up to eight, eight and a half percent. Years ago, if you got eight and a half percent in the in equities on a you can't say guaranteed basis, but on a on a extremely safe solid credit basis you'd be doing well so to remove some of the fluctuation out of the portfolio to remove some of the volatility and and just kind of sleeve that off i think what brian's doing is extremely admirable and and and, uh definitely um a help to those willing to do the the legwork uh i think it's very uh very intelligent for some people to to really kind of look at that really hard now that rates have kind of come back up obviously they backed off a little bit but you know, if we get that that run up again, as many of us are anticipating with a uh, hot CPI number, et cetera, you know, you'll you'll still have muni rates pop back up, too. And I just want to add one thing, Mitchell, and that's, you know, muni bonds on the tax exempt side do better for people in higher tax brackets. But, you know, my kids have some I have two accounts for my my children and they own some taxable uh, sure. municipal bonds yep. and. One thing to note on a taxable municipal bond is that if you buy a taxable municipal bond that's issued in the state that you live in, it is exempt from state tax. Yep. So, you know, if you're in a state um, where there's no tax bracket, it's just a flat rate of 5% or we found out today Illinois is 4.95, right. you know, you still save that money. Um, even though you may be in a lower federal bracket, but that doesn't really matter because you're in a taxable muni for federal purposes and for state purposes, you're not going to be taxed because you purchased a, an individual bond that is, um, you know, issued by a municipality in your state. So California is real big on issuing taxable bonds. I noticed you can get some really great rates in California. Um, so, but Again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to DM me. If you can't DM me because we're not linked up the way Twitter works, just send me an, a, a, a tweet and just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get it figured out. I'm still learning Twitter. I'm kind of a Twitter idiot when it comes to Twitter sometimes. So 
But that's all I've got, unless anyone has any questions. Well, that's awesome. No, great combo, guys. And and I think this stuff like this is really what, what I mentioned last week about sort of maybe doing a, a, a bi-monthly kind of RIA or I know, you know, kind of pro type chat, you know, spaces sessions is kind of exactly the type of content that I was really leaning towards, right, in terms of uh, trying to help uh, folks navigate, um, you know, just kind of how, how they run their business and, and everything from kind of uh, marketing to leveraging stuff like this in terms of um, helping their clients get uh, more tax advantage, tax advent, tax advantageous um, exposures, right? And, and whether that's leveraging munis for a portion of the portfolio, um, other side, as you mentioned, you know, this is, it's it's, it's you know, great stuff, guys. So thank you very much for sharing. It's it's a little it's a little off the notebook topic. I, I get it, and uh, you know, Br- Brian and I no, no, chatted about that today, but it just it's it's something that it's something to consider it really is um especially with rates popping back up to where they are given the extreme volatility i mean we don't have a quad two in sight whether we had a quad two in sight or not you 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 still with some of your money you know uh, i always talk to i i've talked to gavin before about it i've talked to you before about it just sleeves and having different sleeves of your assets do different things for you and there's definitely for someone sitting with a, a pile, there's definitely a, a spot now, given where rates are, with a sleeve and in, in that type of high quality, tax free municipal. Yeah, and I'll just add one more thing: is that it's such a small space in an unknown space that having a clear understanding of how it works actually provides an arbitrage opportunity. Um, most people, you know, who could take advantage of this don't. And when they learn about it, they gravitate to it. So there is an aspect of the municipal bond market that does reward you for doing the legwork and, um, you know, understanding, um, how it works. I'll just add something since my name was brought up there, Mitchell, that's no problem. I just wanted to say that, um, you know, just to make the distinction, I think municipal bonds are are really great for people to look at if they're an income investor. All right. So let's just make it the distinction. Like if you're just running a portfolio, if you're not a high net worth person or you, if you're someone who has made their money already and you're looking to protect it and you're looking for income, then certainly municipal bonds are uh, something you should look at right now and, yep. and talk to an advisor about that. Right. But yep. if you're just running a portfolio, um, I think you would weigh and, and like new to hedge eye. Right. Um, I wouldn't say, Hey, municipal bonds. Right. So I just wanted to make that distinction and, and say, cause really what you ne- necessarily you wouldn't just look at municipal bonds because really what you're looking at here. I think, and what I've been playing for is like what Brian said before, it's like cash is fine and whatever is unfolding right now, I I look at it, the person with the largest cash balance in their account, once this is all settled, and maybe that's in a month, maybe it's in a year, maybe it's in two years, I don't know. But when you get the opportunity to put the throttle back down, um, that's really what, like you're weighing that opportunity. So if you're going to lock up capital and municipal bonds, well, that's a decision. Maybe you made all your money already and you want income, you know? So it's just like that. I just wanted to make that distinction. Yep. Uh, that's, that's why the caveat was there with, uh, if you've already made your pile, if you're sitting there with a the pile and it's, it's something to consider for a sleeve, that's it. Consideration. All right, so if we uh, reset a little bit, just on along those lines, though, uh, you know, BN, BNDX, which is something that we we had had some exposure to, obviously TLT. You know, in a fifteen day window, um, they are looking better, looking more attractive. They certainly, you know, regained some some positive trade, um, you know, in terms of bull, bullish trade exposure, but still bearish trend. Now, again, you know, we kind of talked about this earlier. You know, the move. Um, Index will obviously influence the, the U.S. Treasury market, and and um, you know, but it is obviously something to be paying attention to, which is really what what Gavin's kind of alluding to here. So you know, does do uh, you know do do, do the do the does the U.S. ten year put in um, you know high or low? 
uh, does it put in higher highs, right? Uh, currently, the risk range is saying a, 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 a lower high. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's a good thing, right? So it's putting in a lower high and that, that, uh, low end of the risk range is right on the, the tr trend line. Uh, so keep a, a keen eye on those risk ranges. It's They're going to tell you a lot. And going back to Jimmy's statement about volatility, you know, it's a great way of kind of checking volatility within other markets, ones that you might not have you know, a, a really good grasp in terms of their volatility, but that, you know, for instance, you know, in terms of Jimmy, the, the SS and C, um, you know, risk range, you know, if that's tightening, that means kind of volatility is typically coming out of that asset, right? If it's expanding um, or certainly, you know, you know, kind of getting wider then volatility is getting, you know, is basically going into that asset. Now the question there is, is it an expanding volatility in a positive manner, AKA the top end of the risk range is moving higher uh, and that lower end of the risk range is staying relatively the same. You know, that's a good that's a good kind of, you know, expansion or widening of the risk range. Uh, now, conversely, if they're both going in the opposite directions and that lower end of the risk range is sort of, you know, continuing to kind of uh, be significantly lower than, say, the, 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 the trade line, um, that's something that you got to be paying, paying attention to and, and maybe not adding as aggressively, you know, when it gets to that trade line or gets to that bottom end of the risk range because you, you, you need it to sort of, um, you know, settle in, right? And, and you need it to sort of confirm that it's putting in a bottom of that low end and then going to kind of, you know, recapture that that trade as, as support versus resistance. So just uh, just wanted to kind of um, finish up, I guess, with that, those thoughts there on those two asset classes or those two kind of components. Um, Eyeball is in a very similar boat uh, just from a, from a bond standpoint. It's acted very well, very well in the last 15 days. Uh, but that's also to be kind of expected given the the drastic move in the U.S. Uh, 10 year and PFIX conversely, you know, basically, um, you know, looked kind of weaker there over the last sort of say week, um, but has kind of rebounded and, and, and regained its strength and, and PFIX remains a top performing, you know, bullish asset. So PFIX has been a great exposure all year long alongside the, uh, the, the U.S. dollar or UUP, however you want to express it. And, um, and, and, and then the big elephant in the room, which we'll, we'll get to, is, uh, is obviously gold, uh, which had been certainly a, uh, a relative outperformer, uh, given it's been, you know, it's been flat, you know, relatively flat year to date. Uh, it's given, uh, you know, given, given uh, it's given some back. Let's just put it that way. Uh, but um, we got a couple of new folks that wanted to jump on here from uh, to, to discuss. So before we kind of move on to gold, one, well, let's see what they have to say. Uh, Sublime, welcome. Hey, yeah, thanks for the, letting me speak. Space? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just had a question about municipal bonds. Um, of course. I was wondering what are the returns on average? I know they're probably different, and if there are any ETFs for them. Yeah, so ETFs is an easy question. That would be, you know, BAB, BAB, -A -B or, or MUB. Um, again, there's different kind of components. Some are tax exempt, some aren't. So just, you know, dive into dive into that. The ETF, you can just Google that. That's a pretty easy one to, or not easy, but, um, you know, th those are, are two pretty common ones that, that people use to express municipal bonds. But I'll let uh, Brian kind of answer the, the other portion of that question. Yeah, sure. So, um if you go to uh, um, Robert's uh, tweet for this notebook session, um, I have responded um, and put a chart that shows um, the municipal market data, AAA geo yield, um, assuming a 5% coupon. And you can see there, um, that would be, uh, uh, let me think of a credit. Um, so like, uh, Hilton Head Island, the island of Hilton Head, South Carolina is a AAA rated credit. So if they issued bonds, these are the rates that they would most likely receive on, on their, um, their issuance. Um, but to give you an idea of just kind of uh, where rates are for a single A rated credit, um, I'll just show you what I'm looking. I'll just read to you what I'm looking at right now. Uh, so in, um, in five years, a 267 in the 10 year, a 341, 15 years, a 410, and then in 20 years, a 436. 
higher credit quality instead of a 436, maybe a four and a quarter. Um, if you don't buy it at the initial reoffering price, that four and a quarter is probably more like 4% to 4.1. So I hope that, I hope that gives you an idea of where we kind of currently are. Um, we were buying bonds in more of the 450 camp on that long end when I started publishing this when the muni market was kind of freezing and we were having trouble moving paper. On the ETF side, Robert gave you a taxable ETF and he also gave you a tax exempt ETF. Another one that I like is called MMIN. Um, the only reason I like it is because they invest in insured paper only, which means that there is a company that's standing behind the bond issue to ensure that you get paid. It's a little more conservative uh, in nature because of that, but um, you know the return is reflective of that um, safety. Yeah, and so Blam, I put that uh, that tweet that he's referring to um, is in the the tweet nest. So if you just kind of scroll up here in the spaces, you can you can slide over to that. Uh, it's a couple couple over. So uh, take a look, man. And and there's a there's a good link there and, and some good great detail. So um, so yeah, so, so take 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 a gander. Hopefully that that helped. I see. It. Thank you. Awesome, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for thanks for the question. Uh, Poncho, welcome. Always a pleasure, Mr. Robert. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Hey, I'll, uh, I think uh, Sublime hit on it a little bit there, and I was following on Gavin's comment as well. Um, hey, Brian, thanks so much for all of your insight here to this um, incredibly important, you know, uh, asset category that we're, um, you know, all learning a lot about now, and and, and for me personally, a lot through you. Um, I guess what I was kind of getting at is, is I've spoken with you offline, Brian, is that, you know, some of us aren't, you know, we're not high net worth. We're not uh, income investors, right? You know, I advise my parents a little bit on their money. They're mid sixties retired. Um, I'm just wondering a little bit based on the comments that you initially made tonight, like is the ETF or these ETFs in any way inferior? I mean, you did just mention maybe a, you know, 25 basis point rate difference, whatever. Are they actively managed enough? Um, and, and Robert, I'm I'm really sorry for as, you know being a long long time listener, first time caller, backing up on on something you were um, ready to to move on from. But no, uh, it's all I'm, good. I'm, I'm chopping hard. Like I'm like DSM, GBAB, BAB, MAV, um, <laughs> BNN. You know, like I, I'm really I'm I'm putting the work in. As, again, Brian knows offline. I just I'm I'm wondering if you know for those of us again that aren't high net worth or um, yeah, at that point in life where we're, you know, strictly income based, like, uh, you know, are the ETFs, they're obviously not keeping up with the individuals that go straight to the, the issue. But um, I don't know if there's any comments that the Brian or Mitchell that you guys can add uh, quickly with respect for Robert and Robert, thanks again for all you do, man. I'll hang up and listen. Yeah. Pancho, I'll be happy to answer that. And I, I do receive your messages and I, I, I respond back to them and, I'm happy to speak to you offline if um, if I don't give you a complete uh, answer here. But, you know, I think there's kind of two pieces. There's the now, which is, um, you know, there are people that are looking for some uh, return with uh, a component of, um, you know, tax savings, and they want to do that today. And then there's preparing yourself for down the road where, you know, you need that and you've already educated yourself on how it works. So I think that kind of covers the tax exempt piece of it. The other side of it is, is, is the taxable side, which is, you know, these same issuers at, at certain different times and for different reasons issue taxable bonds, which carry a much higher interest rate. And those aren't necessarily for high net worth people because they're not really attractive, right? They don't want to pay the taxes um, that they would have to pay on that income. So where do the, where do those go? Well, those go to people that aren't concerned as much um, on the tax side. The reason that I think people are looking again at an individual bond as opposed to a fund is because rates have returned to a meaningful level to where you can buy a bond that's going to operate differently and pay a higher return than what you would normally see in like a certificate of deposit. So you can buy this bond knowing that at the 10 year payout uh, optional redemption date or um, at the maturity date, you're going to receive your full principal back as opposed to, um, you know, an ETF where they're continuing to move the money and you not necessarily have that comfort level that you're going to receive your full 
principle back. Um, I don't think that a, a, a fund is inferior to an individual bond. And I don't think an individual bond is inferior to the fund. I think it's more of what you're looking for. Um, each of them offer, you know, uh, different types of diversification. And obviously, uh, uh, buying into a fund that's not leveraged and owns, you know, 300 different bond issues, it's going to be much more diversified than you could ever do individually. That being said, that may not be the, the, best, um, the best strategy that, that you would want to um, you would un- undertake. You'd have to do your due diligence, figure out which one's um, best for you. I think what's going on today and why this topic has um, you know, become a little bit in vogue right now is because we're in quad four and people want income and they want to know that they're buying something that the net asset value is not really – even though it fluctuates, it doesn't necessarily impact them because this is money, or as, as Mitchell said, this is a slave of money that they're going to hold this to maturity or to an early prepayment date. So I hope that answers your question. Brian, that's incredibly helpful as you've always been, and I appreciate it. Yeah. I will have, I will have some offline follow ups for you as you uh, welcome the suggestion, but. Sure, I, 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 I will. I will do that right now, Ponce. I mean, you're 100 percent right. It is in vogue. You know, <laughs> the, the, the thing is, is, is what's the lockup and what you know, what's the men and what's you know, as far as the competitive bidding and all that. But um, let's let's move on with the spaces. And, and Brian, again, thank you so much, Mitchell, as well, for your um, your diligence and comments on the issue. I mean, uh, Brian, who would have thought maybe, you know, we might have to do a one-on-one, my man, uh, you know, and, and it's just, crazy. Isn't it? and it's just like a... I mean, who would have thought, who would have thought that you'd be, you, you, you know, we, we could have a whole hour long or hour and a half long conversation around beauty. Um, my, my not... wife won't even speak to me about this stuff. Robert's like, <laughs> and, 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 and half the time she's on, you know, she's, she's stuck with you on a cruise ship too. Right. So that or the car. <laughs> and it's like, shut up. Like, no way. Uh, but George Syracuse, I, I know you got, your hand raised and I don't know if it's yeah I was just gonna say it is the season but I was gonna try to change the topic and yeah uh, Brian I'll definitely be in contact with you would love to see a one-on-one but just for the sake of uh you know the people who have not made the money yet that kind of thing etc cetera, etc cetera, figured I'd, I'd try to contribute to moving moving it along a little bit so nothing I say is advice so what I'm seeing right now is uh obviously rates oil and gold and you know trend breaks are what a day to two days old so one day can be a head fake even two keith usually says three days or more you know they've kind of confirmed themselves so i've been loving what gavin has been putting up um actually while we were uh listening to some of the uh, the muni stuff i pulled up something i pulled up that I sent to Gavin on May the 4th. And uh, the USO, ticker symbol USO, the U.S. Oil Fund ETF, had been consolidating and squeezing. And, uh, you know, we were kind of talking to each other, and I was like, well, whichever way it goes, we go. And I sent him a picture of a guy on the tight wire. And right now, I feel like we're in the same exact spot where we're on a a tight wire, I don't think the person walking the tight wire is going to make it across the canyon. They're going to fall one way or the other. And, you know, I'm kind of just waiting and watching whichever they, whichever way they go, I go. And I'm curious if anyone is placing bets on one way or the other, has a very strong conviction that the trend breaks we see stick or reverse. You know, that, that's really what I want to hear. I, I want to hear if anyone is um, – Sticking their neck out. I obviously am not. I'm just going to wait and watch. Um, but if anyone has any two cents to chime in, I'd, I'd love to hear it. So, George, you mean on equity or rates or anywhere? I would say on the primary items, the top three, if I had to pick. Uh, number one for me would be oil. Obviously, we had a trend breakdown. I'm curious if people are betting that we stick to bearish trend on the commodity, not just the stocks. Two would be uh, rates. You know, we flirted with the trend line, but we obviously did not break through. We bounced quite, you know, significantly today um, and have that CPI number coming in still. And then number three for me would be gold. 
Uh, I've been pretty heavy gold this year. Been happy with it, even though it gave up its gains. Um, because, you know, on a relative basis, it's relative. It's just like Gavin said about cash. So because almost nothing has worked this year, uh, especially if you're long only. So one, oil, two, rates, three, gold. So I'll comment on oil and rates. So I don't have a view on gold unless Dixie falls off, you know. Uh, dollar, whenever it is so strong, gold has a hard time rallying in dollar terms, even though if you look at it, if you look at gold and say emerging market countries, uh, currency terms, it has gone through to all time highs, generally speaking. But uh, coming back, so I won't comment on the third one, but the first two. So oil, uh, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to get out in time in the futures. I didn't short it. Uh, I'm waiting to watch the 95 level, 95.27 level. Uh, if that doesn't hold, then um, I'll start making some bearish bets. But uh, up until then, I'll be waiting and watching. I'm right now not having a viewpoint um, of uh, bullish, but I do have a slight bullish bias, um, even though it has broken trade and trend. Uh, but at the moment, I don't have a position. So my um, line in the sand for oil is uh, on WTI crude specifically, on uh, 95.27. If that breaks, then I'm whole hog bearish, you know, short every rip. Um, the second is uh, on rates. Um, did you mean 10-year rates or corporate bonds? Or corporate bonds, I'm whole hog bearish. Um, at every yeah, rate. I, I primarily meant uh, treasuries, okay. 10, 20s, 30s. Not yeah, so, so much on the tens. shorter end of the curve. Sure. So on 10s, uh, I just have a view on 10s, not others. Uh, on tens, uh, the every time we get into that three point two, three point five kind of range, uh, we get these long term buyers in terms of uh, insurance companies who have to gather yield, or you know, companies such as sovereign wealth funds, so be it Norges Bank or those kind of folks, because you know they shorten their duration going into uh, this kind of uh, setup. Now that <clears throat> we are actually getting uh, at the three and a quarter, three and a half, they start buying uh, because they are actually people who are going to not have this uh, treasury on their trading side of the book. It will be held to maturity side of the balance sheet for them. Um, so they start. So we're going to linger around in this uh, no man's land for a while uh, between say 2.9 and three and a quarter, 2.9 and three and a quarter, unless we see some major setback in terms of the top four features um, of the uh, of the Nowcast model, um, so that's my take on ten year. Uh, I'm not betting one way anymore. I used to bet one way on ten year that uh, it's going to go keep going down in terms of the uh, futures uh, der derivatives, but right now I'm not holding that view. It's uh, it would be too risky to <coughs> bet on ten year. Uh, especially through futures, um, especially when it hits 3.25 or higher in, in terms of yield. So th those are my viewpoints for 10 year. I'd be, uh, I I'd love to know others views as well. I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty similar trend. Um, oil, uh, you know, I'm actually still long a little bit. Um, which has been okay. I unloaded most of the position back at the first half of June. Um, and I mean, number one rule is like, don't puke. Right. So, um, that's a good one to learn. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'll, it looks like it's done. So, you know, I'll sell on the bounce whenever that comes, whatever. And, um, so that's oil. I'm not looking to short it. Um, it would have to prove itself and get some persistence in terms of trend. Like I could, I could really care less. It's just more like trend set impactful for the inflation number. Um, treasuries, you know, like I said before, 10 years leading the counter trend move because rates are still bullish trend. So I'd look to buy 10 year first for me. Um, but 
you know, I think probably in the next 15 to 30 days, we'll get a shot to, to do that. And that'll be my first shot. You know, I'll tweet it out and be like, this is when I'm buying treasuries this year, you know? And, uh, you know, you could, you'll, you'll be able to see that in real time. Like we'll do that. But, you know, I'm not like, I want to see the, the trends change. It's going to be a phase transition, just like China was like good things take time. So, um, let's just like keep it steady on that gold. I've not really been, you know, we have a, <clears throat> a small position long gold. I get the relative argument, but it's really, uh, I was just looking back. I like tweeting because it's like a journal. Like I, I journal to myself in a notebook, but then also, you know, I could just look back and kind of see when I'm saying things. And, you know, really since the beginning of Q2, there was like this divergence where remember that run where the dollar and gold were running higher together, you know, and all of a sudden that if you're paying attention every day, that shifted. And, you know, it, it's like if your thesis is long the dollar and then you see uh, a market that's been running with your thesis diverge, um, like I would rather be long dollars than gold. So, you know, just kind of like holding a minimum position. I haven't been excited about it for months. The signal continues to deteriorate. I don't really care where it is. It's just like I'd rather be long dollars, you know, right now. So I think Trend made a really good point in terms of, you know, like thinking about it in not just dollar terms. That's pretty interesting. Probably some good like work to do there for me because I, I really just – actually if i think about it like i really only do think about it in dollar terms you know so i could probably do some work there thanks trend yeah, think, always giving me good. some some good uh some good things to work trend on may mention, but I know that, uh, chris more thousand dollar effects mentioned that last week or, or has yeah he, he's great with that kind of stuff yeah yeah same yeah. with the TL, same with like tlt i mean if you if you pull that up on trading view you can put both of those um there's a, there you can basically um uh you divide it right by the currency so you can put in like tlt or us 10 year uh and then you can depending on which which direction or what you want want you either you know denominator slash uh nominator or whatever you know what i'm talking about um you put it conversely right so kind of you know btc usd right is, is one way of doing it and then you could do btc jpy right and you're gonna get a different different outlook in terms of uh, what the, you know, what Bitcoin is doing, let alone what US 10 year or, or, or gold is. And uh, it, it's quite the divergence because Gavin, exactly because the US dollar has been so strong, uh, you know, the, the, the relative, you know, the, basically the strength um, of those assets in other currencies is, is, uh, is not as bad, right? You know, it's, it's, it's quite, I won't say it's robust, but it's certainly, you know, stronger than, than what we've experienced in the dollar in dollar denominated um, version. Yeah. I was yeah. just going to bring up too, um, just to piggyback on the, the treasuries thing. Like, does anyone have any, or has anyone done any good work like on the curve, like twos, tens inverting? Like we saw the, the initial inversion and then here we are inverting again. Um, you know, I guess just generally on like, well, how, how inverted can this get and what happens after the inversion? I've heard a lot of people talk and, you know, different economists on Twitter and stuff like that, or, you know, people we might be following uh, here and there saying like, well, maybe the curve uh, typically steepens very quickly, like after an inversion or, you know, if, if anyone on here has any thoughts about that. Yeah. I'll open that up for George. Go ahead. Yeah. So I'm very passionate about yield curve inversion and how accurate it's been as a signal of impending recession historically, and then which, you know, relationships have the highest uh, predictive value. And um, I don't know why people are so passionate about this and, like, love to argue with each other. It's, you know, to me, it's just data. And um, for me, the math is the math, and that is that the 10-year versus the three-month and six quarters ahead – uh, versus the three month have been the uh, best uh, at predicting impending recession within the next, you know, like 
18 to 24 months. Uh, the twos tens is also very accurate, but it has uh, produced more false positives. So you have an accuracy level maybe in the you know mid to high 80s on twos tens, uh, 18 to 24 months out, whereas the uh, ten year versus the three month and six quarters ahead versus three month, you know you're in the 90s, and it, and the two of them have only given one false positive since World War II. And that was in 1966. So you're talking about something like 13 out of 14 occurrences of them being accurate. Um, whereas two t- two's tens, you can find some areas where it's kind of a head fake and, you know, it might be a, a little bit early. But then, you know, those other um, relationships end up going a little bit after. So for me, making a recession call is a big deal. You know, I, wrote, I put my newsletter out like a week or two ago, and I said, um, we may already be in recession, technical recession, um, depending on this GDP print. But um, I don't feel the need to make a recession call until I see uh, the two relationships that have not produced the false negative since 66 go. You know, because really, like, what, do you want to make money or be right? I mean, I feel like people are passionate and arguing over semantics. So that would be the three-month ten-year? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the, the ten-year minus the three-month And that's version. basically still like 100 basis points wide, right? Yeah, yeah. So like the ten, yeah, okay. But if the Fed actually does what everyone expects them to do, they're going to invert it anyway. So it's like, okay, the twos, tens was right, but you know, six months later, the 10 year, three month went. And it's just a way of being that much more confident because, you know, like in 1998, you have twos, tens going, you know, I believe there's one other occurrence other than 1966 where it happens. So one false positive since World War II out of 13 or 14 occurrences versus three. That's, that's really the difference. That's what you're looking at. And the fact that people get emotional and like argue over this, it's silly. It's it's not it's noise, honestly. Yeah, I mean, I just pulled it up. So in TradingView, again, I use TradingView as as a key key uh, key tool. Um, I like it's free. So just anybody out there, trade TradingView, it's free. Um, but you can look that up as US ten US ten Y minus US. Oh, 3M. Um, and yeah, man, uh, yeah, so just in the last three years, you got, it went negative in, in Q3 of 19. And then uh, in obviously in March of 2020, so Q1 of 2020, and, and sitting at, you know, uh, Gavin's right, right about, you know, 100 pips wide um, in terms of that spread. But it's also come down from, you know, uh, 2.20 in uh yeah, just a few weeks ago on May 9th, right? So it was uh, north of 2.20% uh, 2. wide. And has been cut more than in half at this point in the last uh, in the last two months, which is uh, which is telling. Yeah, if you give it some more rate hikes, and the long end of the curve, yeah, uh, the rates wise go down because it's just yeah, activity is ceasing up, jobless claims are ripping. <laughs> it's going to invert. Yeah, you know, and, yeah. and just look, <laughs> you know, look at uh, uh, federal funds. Uh, you go to Fred, um, the Federal Reserve's website. I'm just used to Googling Fred and getting the Federal Reserve website. Um, pull up a uh, federal funds rate versus the 10-year versus three-month, and it's pretty spot on. You know, They start tightening into a slowdown, they invert the curve. It's just a matter of time and you know, there was thing earlier this year. I was saying, are we already in recession? And that's why the yield curve is steepening, at least like ten year versus three month. And I give a lot of kudos to uh, Danielle DiMartino Booth because uh, I continuously like nag and pester. Do you think the ten year versus three month is going to invert? And she'd be like, Yep, 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 yep. Asked her at Hedge Eye Live it was the same thing. Oh, yep, yep, yep. It'll invert. Just wait. Give it time. <laughs> that's awesome. Just yeah, one grad. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. You know, I was just gonna say, um, I know on last quarterly macro themes update, Gavin, um, Hedge I put out 
a good slot in terms of uh, yield curve yield curve conversion. I thought it was in the deck from last week, but I'm not finding it right now. Now again, I'm going to do this on the fly. But uh, last last quarter's update, um, I'm almost positive I had it. I can't remember what slot it was, but uh, it, it's got a good good. They put a good graph together, um, certainly in last quarters. And if I find it, I'll uh, I'll screenshot it. Yeah, there's another good one that the uh, San Francisco Fed put out in 2018. Now, obviously, since then, we've had some more inversion and recession, but it's only one occurrence. So you can just update the numbers yourself because it's not a huge data set. You know, if it's, I think it's happened right. 14 or 15 times now since World War II. So it's, it's, it's a simple arithmetic. Yeah, nice. All right, Chen. Uh, floor is yours, buddy. Yeah, I was just adding that uh... – Generally speaking, the bond market globally is in a route, right? At this point of time, uh, working with bonds in general can not only be tricky unless you're playing through options, it's going to be extremely challenging and difficult to risk manage because, uh, as I expressed earlier, in the uh, lower grade bonds, the liquidity is drying up. And in that segment of the market, it's just a matter of time when we'll start seeing some sort of a crash-like situation. Now, I'm not calling for the 1994 kind of crash because the Fed has managed extremely well with their communication this time around by jawboning, by signaling, with transparent communication as against what happened in 1994. Back in 1994, it was kind of sudden. The inflation expectations were all over the place and we had a sudden crash in one day. This time around, if you look at year to date from January to now, uh, the bonds, not not just in U.S., but I hear this pain from many investors across the world, be it in Europe, be it in Asia, that uh, their global bond market is having a problem, uh, generally speaking. Plus, the strong dollar is causing corporate finance folks to become extremely active hedging managers in order to manage their uh, currency uh, basis uh, risks, uh, especially if they're exporters uh, coming in from Asia and other places. Uh, so these two aspects, if these go slightly more out of hand than where they're at right now, uh, we're going to see some very interesting fireworks. And as uh, our beloved friend of the space, uh, Mike Taylor says, uh, we, we should be ready to go blotter. In fact, Last uh, space, I remember we were discussing when uh, when Chris was here, right? Christopher Moyer, Thousand Air FX. He specifically uh, was saying that okay, be safe, right? And immediately within two days, we saw a bunch of crypto-related issues that happened. One was with Voyager. Uh, there was another one that happened where withdrawals were being stopped. I think one of them was called Coin something. Uh, I forgot, but that that's happening not just in crypto land. Eventually, um, we might start seeing this liquidity strike. Um, let me repeat, liquidity strike in some of our normal day-to-day businesses, especially where they are CCC or lower and they need financing in the next three to six months. So what I said in my earlier uh, discussion, uh, definitely to keep an eye out. If you have anything in your portfolio that needs uh, financing and it's CCC or lower or generally speaking, lower grade, try to weed it out. Um, It is going to be very interesting and challenging time uh, going forward. Yeah. So, you know, George, just kind of wrap up on your, your general question about, you know, trend lines and breaks and and what have you. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, (laughs) This is the the notebook review, right? So it's about what's jumping off the page, and and really it's it's about the signal. And, and we we we're lucky that we get all three of those um, on a daily basis, right? From if you're leveraging the hedge eye process, you get those risk ranges. Um, I kind of mentioned this a few minutes ago, but the the, the low end of the ten year two seven seven is right on trend. Um, once that goes below trend, um, I'm not I'm, I'm gonna I'll, I'll start to kind of take a look at that um, uh, that asset class, or certainly that that the U.S. ten year. Uh, in a bit of a different light, but right now it, it it's uh, the low end of the risk range from a math standpoint. 
um, it, it bounced right off of it. And now, you know, could we head back up to the top end of the risk range? Absolutely. That, that's what the math dictates, but it could also go right back down. And, and if that, and, you know, if the, you know, general volatility comes out of that, that marketplace, then, you know, you could see that risk range, um, you know, tighten up and, you know, obviously in terms of a bullish signal, that low end of that risk range is going to start to, uh, move lower and, and move below the trend line. And that's going to be something that I'll be paying attention to and, and looking for over the next uh, over the next few weeks. And until that happens, um, I'm going to remain short uh, U.S. Treasuries uh, because that's what the signal dictates. Um, and, and that's what and, and kind of similarly, could, could, you know, same thing could be said for gold. I mean, I know, you know, coach hit the button today, you know, pretty close to the low end of the risk range. But, you know, that, you know, in that same light, you know, at 1751, that's below the trend of 1771. And, and it's, uh, and, and, and so, yeah, so, I mean, basically conversely, if you're really sticking to the process and I know, you know, he, he gave kind of reasons why to so go review the RTA today, I don't need to repeat them. Um, but if you're sticking to the process, I mean, you, you really wouldn't have been buying that until that loan of the risk range sort of, uh, or, or a GVZ, the volatility kind of confirmed that wasn't going to push up, uh, beyond the top end of the risk range. Now it did hold barely, I think it closed like 2198 or something like that. So it closed right at that 22 level. Um, but, you know, just be paying attention because if that blows out to 24, 25, you know, let alone 30, uh, you know, that, that you could see a real, uh, you know, that bottom end of that risk range is going to go significantly lower. Uh, so again, you know, gold has been an asset class to Gavin's point um, that we were, you know, certainly very favorable of uh, from the beginning of the year. It worked out really, really well. And then uh, it's sort of just definitely, and we've talked about this a number of times. I, I mean, I think I mentioned it last week that, you know, gold gold would need to go to the low end of the risk range. And then, and, uh, and, and, and GBZ would need to, you know, stay below 20 was my number. I needed it to stay below 20. Uh, so, you know, uh, given the outlooks and the quads, you know, there's different ways of expressing that, but I've, I've used longer dated call options in, in GLD to express that. Uh, so I have not gained kind of uh you know, near-term exposure, but, uh, you know, everyone can jump down my throat for, you know, losing premium and all, of, all of this other, you know, whatever. You can, you can tell me how to do my shit a uh, different day, but, uh, you know, that's how I've been expressing it, George. And, and, and again, and, and I'll get longer right now. My actual kind of like, you know, quote, unquote, physical gold exposure is, is still about, is a min position, but that's primarily because I'm, I've held it from, you know, the, those positions are, have been held from, from January timeframe. So, um, so yeah, so just wanted to kind of, you know, again, kind of wrap it up in that perspective. I think, you know, there's a lot of, again, enjoyed, I'm not harping any question from, from a noise perspective, but there's a lot of noise out there, right? Everyone's trying to figure out what to do. Everyone's trying to, you know, you know, to grab onto pieces of the puzzle that's going to help them, you know, put this Rubik's cube back together. And I know I'm using different analogies there, but uh, it's, it's a challenging complex, right? This game is hard and, and you've got to figure out your process. I think that was one of the things I, again, we can kind of like get back to that right now is, is getting back into your process, figuring out what's important to you. What, what are the tools? And, and George, you mentioned it sort of like, you know, the, the you'll call it curve inversion. If that's something that you want to kind of, you know, not necessarily focus on, but just use as a tool in your toolbox, then amazing, right? Uh, is that something that I might use? Uh, unlikely. Again, that's just me, man. And, and, and I know you know that I'm not harping on you, um, but it's just, you know, everybody's got to figure out what works for them, what helps them build their portfolio successfully, right? And the end game for all of us here that are listening in is, you know, to preserve, protect, and compound. Um, right now, we're certainly in a preserve and protection mode. Uh, and and there aren't many places that to, to put capital and, you know, China has, you know, basically the signal has been gaining strength there over the last few weeks and, and has been confirming uh, its positive, you know, positive outlook. But again, you're going it, to, it's a volatile place, you know, it has a trending, you know, basically historical volatility c- component and it's not trending, excuse me, it's just historically volatile you know, place to, to invest. And, and uh, you've now also going to get these noisy headlines about headlines about COVID. Uh, and COVID scares. So again, what I will say to that is stick with like the process, right? Track, you know, you know, track whether this is like trending and episodic, right? Um, or or kind of non-trending, uh, sorry, whether it's trending, like bouts of COVID or volatility or what have you, or is it just non-trending, right? And and, and this is just an episodic bout and it's something to be take, take, take advantage of at certain spots, right? So trend lines, trade lines, um, have your spots, right? Have those limit orders, be patient. And it goes for pretty much every asset class, right? Whether it's 
you know, maybe shorting 10 year or buying 10 year, right? If you want to buy the 10 year at 334, that's on, you know, that that's something that you can do. But uh, is it something that I'll be doing at 334? Again, not unless that low end of the risk range is, you know, below trend at that point in time. So um, kind of rant over there, but I will say, and one interesting component is um, there's been a lot of, again, I don't have the data and, and I harped on the other side of them doing this like a week or two ago, but um, the f- flows of, of capital um, certainly appears to be shifting away from, you know, energy related or commodity related exposures, you know, call it XLE, um, you know, uh, crude oil, what have you, and into more safe havens, right? The large caps, you can kind of see that on the board. Now, again, I'm, I'm waiting for the actual fund flow data to come out, but to, to kind of confirm that. Um, but to me, in terms of like places where, Again, you didn't really ask for conviction because I'm not going to give conviction, but in terms of like where I'm executing on the edges in terms of the top end of the ranges would be in the stuff that basically everybody owns, right? Uh, so shorting the Amazon, the the, the Google, the Apple, uh, Tesla, right? I mean, they're all bearish trends and continuing to confirm that. And, you know, the trend lines for most of those are pretty significantly higher. Uh, now that those will come down because the higher prices are falling out of the three month look backs. So just be cognizant of that. Those trend lines are shifting, you know, lower uh, because it's just math, but um, you know, that's, that's kind of what I'm looking at. I think those are great opportunities on the short side. And if you can't get short them, um, then stay in cash because that's going to be your best bet. Yeah. Hey man, I, I have one other thing I forgot to yeah, uh, mention it. before. By the way, I loved all those those points you just made. Um, I just thought it was interesting today. I noticed uh, in my tracking that um, spot S S and P has been at a implied vol discount si- since the sixteenth of May, and uh, I know we talked about earnings and JPM next Thursday, all the way through to the end of July with Apple and Exxon and all the tech and financials, but you know, I, it's like, it, to me, it's like the same thing is, is teeing up again. It's like, you're, you're waiting for the fat pitch to short equities or to get long volatility. I mean, to think, to think like that the S and P is going to go into Tim cook saying whatever he's going to say on the I wrote it down today. What is it? Apple 28th. To think that the S&P is going to go into Tim Cook or the call or whatever for their earnings and it's going to be at a discount, like that's kind of insane, right? Because we have to remember like everyone still doesn't know what he's going to say. <laughs> it's like this happened last time. Yeah, It's like <laughs> we were at a discount. And I'm like, are we really going to go into these mega cap tech earnings at a discount? And then all of a sudden the VIX was like over 30 and then Apple was reporting earnings. So I, I'm not saying I know what's going to happen when they report. I have no idea. But the idea is like, are we really going to have a discount? You know? And I don't know. But it's it's been at a discount for a while. So, 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 so Gavin, you might want to become a 50 cent trader. There's a very famous legend of VIX 50 cent trader uh, from the rapper's name 50 cent. What is it? What is it? So basically, uh, the, I mean, at different points of time in history, in order to hedge their long book, uh, there were these various uh, separate hedge fund managers. Okay, no, rela- no, absolutely no relation to each other. Um, they used to buy these fifty cent out of the money VIX uh, call options, uh, especially heading into these kind of volatile period, right? Like red hot zones uh, into in terms of catalyst or in terms of uh, you know, just like how you described the Apple setup. And then it would explode and give them uh, that sort of uh, uh, mark-to-market protection because now suddenly volatility is high. The stocks are kind of plummeting. But on the other side, those VIX 50 cent uh, all options are shooting through the roof. FT had, a, had an article on that uh, VIX 50 cent. If you look it up, you'll find it. There's a bunch of coverage from Bloomberg also for a variety of folks, but uh, it's it's uh, it's a pretty commonly uh, discussed legend within the options traders. So, VIX fifty cent. Yeah, trend. If I remember correctly, every time 
Kim Jong Un did a missile test. Fifty Cent got paid. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know about. Wait, that. are we actually talking about Fifty Cent like trading, or are we just talking about Fifty Cent options? G unit? No, not not the actual Fifty Cent. There was a guy. I think he was paying Fifty Cents per contract, but he was buying like twenty five million dollars with the contracts, and he kept rolling this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I remember this because I told one of my friends about this, and they read an article back in I think twenty eighteen. And yeah. they're like, uh, 50 Cent makes $350 million on this one bet. And right. my buddy texts me and goes, was that you? I'm like, no, I wish it was me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but, no, yeah, no, 50 Cent was making money every single time the fix popped. Right, right. So the reason I brought it up is because what Gavin just described is a very interesting setup. And in such a scenario that kind of, uh, you know, Wix, uh, especially if you're going into the earnings season, we have a – triple whammy lined up, right? There's no buyback. We know that Q2 wasn't good, right? Be it because of the Ukraine invasion, uh, partial effect because, you know, the invasion started on 24th February. Business started stopping their exposure to Russia in March. And there was a carryover effect that they discussed uh, in April about their impact from Ukraine. But also discretionary goods in general have been... uh, you know, people are trying to postpone that. In in fact, in the tweet nest above, I've shared uh, how Amazon's page views uh, are fairly highly correlated with their quarterly revenue year on year. Uh, and uh, uh, this is both you're comparing the page views year on year with the uh, with the revenue year on year quarterly revenue. And what I see right now, at least for Amazon, and this is just the retail side, right? They have AWS, they have the ads business, which is $32 billion run rate, AWS is $60 billion run rate. So that business is still stable and there's no alternative data for that. But at least on Amazon side, the retail side, it has considerably slowed uh, by more than 10% on a year-on-year basis. Uh, and that's part of the reason why, <clears throat> even though uh, even though from the Hedge Eye team, um, Crime Dog is extremely bullish on Amazon on a long-term basis, but in the short term, it would be hard to play it uh, from that standpoint. So going back to uh, our top large caps, right, Gavin, uh, it's not just Apple. It's also Amazon. It's also, I don't know about Google, so I won't you know, comment on that, but a uh, bunch of other large, Microsoft has already said they're going to have some translation risk, right, because the dollar has been so strong and they have global revenue sources uh, when they do translation internally. It doesn't affect their long-term free cash flow generation, but it definitely affects their immediate this quarter's uh, results. So if three, four large caps are saying they're having trouble, uh, and if you look at how the consensus estimates were adjusted by the analyst, they only brought down Q2 by a little bit, but the year-end targets, they have kept the same or slightly higher. So in the tweet, I've also shared the facts that estimates. It's kind of weird that year-end estimates, they kept the same, but then the, uh, then the Q2 ones, they have kept uh, slightly lower, not a whole lot lower. So having said that, the point I'm trying to drive is if we have a VIX geezer, uh, this is often called as a VIX geezer when you go suddenly from 25 to 35 or 40 VIX or or even more, uh, Gavin, the, that 50 cent kind of trade works out. You need to think about it, how you're going to structure it, what's a reasonable probability, where you're going to land and <laughs> where are your options. So you, you're going to trade on wall of wall you're betting on wall of wall going up, pushing your VIX and the VIX option much higher than it could be. So that's one one way to look at it from a trade perspective. Uh, and purely from a signal perspective, the way you follow it is you, it's basically a momentum trade on VIX. Um, you have to follow both the VIX as well as the wall of wall. Um, so that's that's two things I wanted to share. I love it. I could just be over here drinking vitamin water. <laughs> like I'm 50 cent, like just putting on options trades in the PA. I might do it. Yeah, getting paid well, off on that VIX trade is like when Coca-Cola comes to buy your vitamin water. <laughs> I like it. Trend, we're going to talk. We're going to talk. Can you guys uh, keep carrying on my daughter just to give you like three minutes, two minutes? Yeah, well, I, I think what's interesting, though, is like, is it really going to be like last earnings season? It's like 
everyone forgot that they have to report and VIX, like obviously the price of puts are going to go up. And then to Brian's point before, I thought it was a great call out. Like we're halfway through to the next Fed meeting. And it's like, so then right after earnings in a few weeks, you know, after basically Apple reports, and that's going to be what, like three more weeks and then the Fed meeting. So it's like, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty going into that too, no matter what you think is going to happen with the hike or not a hike or how much they're going to hike, but the uncertainty. So we're kind of like in this, in this spot right now where it's, you know, like no one has to really um, think about the reality. Like we're just kind of in this twilight zone and then in a few weeks it's going to start to hit. And again, I'm not calling for like, you know, equities down. I, I'm just calling, I'm just commenting on volatility is a function of uncertainty. Right. So, um, can kind of push the uncertainty to the side for a little bit. And then in a few weeks, it's going to kind of come to roost. Do you guys have any thoughts on, um, I heard a couple people saying that earnings, you know, are going to get reported on a nominal basis. And so like we could have a GDP number, that's negative and puts us in a technical recession, but because CPI has been so high, second quarter earnings nominally may not actually put us into a technical earnings recession. Um, I don't know how much of an impact that would even have. It could be just complete semantics, kind of like which relationship in the yield curve means anything. You know, at the end of the day, rate of change is really what's going to matter. And if the revisions going forward stink, you know, like the year end gets really pulled down when they report second quarter earnings. But I'm curious if if anyone has any thoughts about, you know, earnings being reported on a nominal basis and that's somehow making things better. It's probably just noise, but I figured I'd bring it up. Yeah, I suspect, I mean, I would lean noise, but uh, I think Brian might have a comment about it. Sorry, I, I, I hit the wrong button. I just want to piggyback oh, no. off what Gavin said. In in like, so, I literally have on my. So, so George, uh, go with noise and, and focus on the rate of change. Okay, Brian, go ahead. Hundred um, <laughs> percent. Yeah, I I, uh, I literally have on my calendar and put in my calendar in, in bright red when the Fed meets, um, because I see these patterns where, you know, the Fed meets and and you have the VIX going in, you know, plus 30 and we getting all this action and we're all on everything, following everything. Right. And then here we are exactly to the day, three weeks after the last fed meeting. And even though triple Q is below 300, when it was at 300 prior to the last meeting, it was at like 311. Um, you know, everyone acts like everything's over. It's all great again. And, we all know and, and, and believe that um, the, the bearish trend is going to play itself out here. It's just the timing of it, right? It's, it's following the, the, for me, the Mike Taylor roadmap so I don't get distracted and I stay on course. But in three, exactly three weeks from now, we're going to have the Fed meeting and they're going to meet and we will have some serious earnings, uh, hopefully, well, depending on which way you're looking at it, um, earnings recessions playing out while they're looking at the next CPI print, right? And when you look at Hedge Eye's CPI forecast, they're forecasting the next CPI print to be higher than the last and then trending down from there. And if the Fed is truly rear, rear view looking, um, like you know we have come to, um, to be educated on, then that's the policy mistake in action, right? That's the that's the slow motion train wreck in progress, um, you know. And and Keith's been talking about it, and even MT's been talking about it. And it's like you can see the setup. Um, and and I love Keith's tweets of Patience Jedi. That's where I feel like we are right now. We're just in this this exact midpoint before everything's going to get all. Um, you know, 30 plus VIX again, but um, Gavin, I don't know if you agree with that. Um, but I that, do. That's I'm just I actually just, that's just I'm how just, I mean, roadmap it. If you, I'm just looking if you, to correct myself real quick. Hold on. So the Fed actually does the, is the FOMC on the 27th? 
Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I misspoke before then. I was thinking. So it's actually going to hit at the same time as like Apple earnings, basically. And the GDP number. Yeah. All right. When's yeah, CPI? sorry about that. When is CPI? Does anyone know the CPI date? Is, CPI is next week, the thir- uh, 13th or 14th. Okay. So we're going to have the, 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 so, so, Hold on. So CPI, JP Morgan, Citigroup, uh, you know, go down the list. Yep. And then you got BlackRock on Friday, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then you got, um, <laughs> and then uh, I think Amazon is the 20, uh, is like the 25th or 26th, something like that. Amazon Jeez. Tesla are like the week of the 25th. And um, Facebook, I, I don't want to misquote. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. But um, yeah, it's all happening basically those last two weeks of, of yep. July. All right. So I then I'm going to make a prediction. Down. I'm going to make a prediction. Down. What are you sorry, sorry, Brian? What what are you confirming trend? Am I correct, right? Oh uh, yeah, no, I was saying just it's a complete dress down in the next three to four weeks. Yeah. yeah. So so August third. Yeah. So and so sorry, just, Brian, before you do that, just if you go look back on slide um slide thirty in today's uh from the macro themes deck on on um uh, not the macro themes deck from the uh, macro shows deck this morning, right? They always give you the uh, expected number of rate hikes. But if you go back and kind of look, a similar thing in terms of like trending down the sideways in terms of rate hikes, expectations happened um, up until the CPI print. And, you know, because of Juneteenth last month, I think it came out a day late or something like that. But anyway, long story short, um, that, that could be wrong. But, but anyway, um, it, it basically went from call it seven and a quarter, seven and a quarter to 11.62 in a matter of weeks. And, we're seeing a very similar thing, you know, post post the Fed meeting. It's been, you know, down to the side, you know, well, down in this case. And, you know, the CPI print, you know, who knows what happens. But uh, you can see a very similar thing. Now, it, at the end of the day, does it matter? In my humble opinion, right? Like, does it matter what the Fed does? It doesn't matter, you know, if they write, if they hike 50 bips, 75, 100. Um, to me, it only matters, like, what, how it changes the math or how it changes the inputs that influence the the signals. So that, that's all I'd say, right? In terms of like that data points, and, and I get sometimes frustrated on on Twitter how everybody's hyping up. You know, it's a fifty bips or a seventy five bips, blah blah. Like it doesn't doesn't matter, right? It matters how it influences what um, what the inputs are for the signals and the CPI prints that are estimates in the nowcast model, and or sorry, the, just the inflation numbers and the in the GDP nowcast and all that kind of stuff. So that that's what it matters. That's how it influences it. Um, and until that shifts and moves from a quad four away to something else that's more investable, I'm not, I'm not, I don't really care how much they increase or deep or whatever, even if they decrease. <laughs> anyway, Brian, yeah, go ahead. I, I was actually just going to make a joke that on August 3rd, I'm going to, uh, with, with all this wackiness that's coming, trend will probably be in the Bill Gates category and I'll just manage his muni bond portfolio going forward. <laughs> <laughs> You're hilarious. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, last thing I want to add, I got to jump off is I just put the link up to the third tweet on um, your post, Robert, that has nice. the bond prospectus right. that um, that Mitchell's looking at. So, if anybody wants to look at it and kind of follow along as we move through the process. All right. Good night, yeah, everybody. I'll, good night, buddy. I'll throw that up in the in the in the nest too. Yeah. Awesome. I mean. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting couple of weeks uh, for those that are listening in, obviously, right? And and all I'd say is, you know, stick with data, stick with the numbers, um, just like I've been trying to reiterate all night long. So hopefully, everyone's <laughs> cluing in on that, and and that there's uh, there's a lot of you know there's a lot of components of kind of managing the near term, but it's really about what's on the horizon. And I think there's a big big opportunity here on the horizon to um, preserve and protect your capital, and and you know if you can you know, to, to potentially compound it because, because we are going into, or, you know, it certainly appears as though we're going into a buzzsaw. Yeah, George, go ahead, buddy. Yeah. I was just going to say that, uh, you know, I think we have over 200 people in here tonight. And I just want to remind everyone that it's very important that you go to Robert's profile, click on his link tree, click on listener support and buy the man a cup of coffee most of you have five dollars. You've probably gotten that much worth of value out of this tonight. So just make sure you go to Robert's profile, click on the link tree, 
and listener support. Make sure you give value for the value that you received. If you didn't get anything, don't give anything. But if you got at least a cup of coffee worth, give it back. That's very kind, George. Thank you. And, uh, and yes, you can follow his instructions and you can find that. Uh, but it's really nothing without everybody who listens in and, and joins and, and contributes. It's, uh, it's always a fun night and, and, you know, I look forward to it every week and, and I think it was a good one. So hopefully you did find some value in it tonight. And again, it's, uh, you know, I kind of tweeted this out earlier and, and so many jokes that, was, that I was kind of doing a marketing night and I, I really wasn't, that was not my intention, but it was more so just about reiteration in terms of, um, you know, what, how this started, right? I mean, it started with a small group getting together, just wanted to talk about how they can, you know, better position their portfolio and, and better learn uh, or kind of better, um, you know, how they adjust, right? How they adjust their, you know, process, how they adjust the way that they're, they're uh, thinking about, you know, the signals or uh, deploying kind of some of the signals that are jumping off the page and, and how that, you know, uh, conveys into a portfolio allocation. And um, so hopefully again, you know, that's, that's what everybody's tuning in to hear about. Um, and I know we can get off on a little bit of, you know, side tangents and stuff like that. But, um, but again, that that's really at the core what it's all about. It's all about kind of improving your process so that you can, you know, if you're, um, in a room by yourself, which many of you are, you can kind of execute and, and, and as I said, preserve, protect in this environment in quad four, but, uh, but then when the time comes or, or when you see an opportunity, right. When you're out on the outlier. So again, if you wanted to, right, that's a 2.77, you know, do you short treasuries or put on some TLT puts again, that's, that's your call. That's up to you. Uh, trend wasn't there, um, but I, I did it. Uh, so that's how I expressed that, uh, you know, uh, how I expressed it. Um, but again, that's not the right call for everybody. It's not, um, you know, everyone's got their own portfolio and their, their own, their own views. Should we wrap up with that boys though? Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again for, for another good, good session. And uh, we'll be back next week. It'll be an earlier one, 4.30. Uh, I might have to move that actually. I might, ha I might still be on the road. Um, so that'll be TBD. I'll have to do that. Uh, yeah, I'll have to figure that one out. Sorry. I'm just thinking about this, uh, as I'm going to, sorry about that. You're getting real time <laughs> majority thought process. Yeah. So I may have to, we may have to do another evening session next week. Uh, but, uh, but we'll, uh, I'll, I'll play that by ear and keep everybody posted. Um, but we'll, uh, and again, and, and, and the RA thing, I am going to get that going. Um, and probably next week as well, we'll, we'll maybe do our first session uh, a bit more kind of focused on uh, how to, you know, how to kind of, uh, again, just helping everybody who does this professionally, whether it's an independent RIA, whether you work for a bullet bracket or, or, and, and kind of everything in between, you know, how, how can you deploy the process in, in, a, in the best way for your clients? You know, what kind of tools do you need, whether it's tech stack or um, just simple things like, uh, you know, writing a letter like George communicated tonight. And I know other side does that as well. And I'm sure many, many of you uh, do that for many of your clients. So, uh, so look for that in the next uh, week or two, we'll get that, that jump started. I know, um, uh, Jimmy and, and turtle capital, I think are going to kind of join me as sort of co-host and, and, uh, hopefully we'll get a lot of, uh, RAs and, and folks that do this professionally, um, kind of get to chime in and, and share some of their stories and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, so hopefully that should be another, another good good spaces but um yeah thanks again everyone for for a wonderful night and uh, we'll see you soon thank you good thank night thank you cheers